Are you journeying through grief and needing a little extra support, inspiration, healing, and guidance? Join me in turning your losses into gains. Hi, my friend. I'm Tara Accardo, creator of the Losses Become Gains online community, blog, and now podcast. I'm an only child who lost both parents to cancer within six months of each other, followed by my sweet fur baby soon after. After all of this, I knew I was meant to do more with what I had been through. And now that means supporting and empowering grievers just like you. I'm a wife, friend, grieving daughter, writer, course creator, loss advocate turned grief coach, and I'm here to support you and move you through your grief. I want for you to feel like I'm your friend in the grief space and know that whatever you're going through, there's someone out there who just gets it. Few topics are off limits here because grief and loss don't hold back either. We'll get into the nitty gritty of what all of this means for you, some coping tools, lifestyle topics, and impactful mindset shifts to take you from just surviving to thriving after loss. So grab a cup of your favorite beverage, get comfortable, and show up with an open heart and mind. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome back to the Losses Become Gains podcast. Today I'm here with a very raw and very honest solo episode as sort of a reflection of three years without my dad, Greg Jordan. And on this exact day, July 13th, three years ago, my dad ultimately succumbed to his prostate cancer journey. To say it was a devastating time in my life is the biggest understatement ever. (laughs) And really, I just wanted to kind of share what I'm thinking and feeling and everything that's coming up today. And really your gain today is honestly just to get to know my dad a little better, but also to just have a very real conversation about the pain around losing a father or a father figure. But honestly, whether or not you've lost a father specifically, I have no doubt that some of the things I will say or get into in this episode will be really relatable for you because in so many ways, at the end of the day, we know loss is loss. We experience it differently, of course. Our loved ones have impacted us in different ways. We all might have different ways of losing people, right? But I think one of the most beautiful parts about grief is how it can bring us all together at the end of the day. But I think these milestones, these rather depressing milestones <laughs> of these death anniversaries of our loved ones are important to acknowledge and to reflect back on. So if this can help anyone else out there today, or if you feel maybe just a little bit less alone after listening to this podcast, that's my goal. So really with this episode, I don't have a ton planned. I don't have a very formal script or anything. I just wanted this to be a very organic, very flowy conversation where I tell you a little bit about my experience, but moreover, just how I'm feeling, what you may expect if you are maybe not as removed from your losses yet, or this might just validate how you've already been feeling or what you've already been experiencing. And most importantly, what I have learned since then in these last three years. So, I mean, first and foremost, really so much of what I'm reflecting back on is the morning he died and it's not in a way where it's like I'm trying to relive it or it almost, I mean, of course it makes me sad, but not in like a really toxic negative way that I'm reliving it. It's more just like, what was I feeling? What was I going through? And for reference, my dad passed away a little bit before 3.30 in the morning. And with where I live now, he was in a post-acute facility, essentially hospice, um, thankfully like five minutes from my house. So I did miss his actual death. I was there with my mom. I wasn't there with my dad. I have thoughts and feelings about that, but ultimately I think I was not meant to be there for a variety of reasons. I talk about this on my blog as well, but I digress. I got the call. Um, just thank God, just a few minutes, barely after he died, they they knew, they caught it. And they called me. They said, 
I, I can't actually, to be honest with you, remember exactly what they said, but they somehow informed me, <laughs> I think I blacked it out, that dad had died. And if I'd like to come say goodbye or if I'd like to just be there, um, that I'm happy to, you know, welcome to do that. So of course I did, jumped right out of bed. Um, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even cry at that point. I didn't cry until I got there, until I saw him. Um, I remember it being eerily still. I mean, of course, it's 3.30 in the morning too, so it's just a still time of night anyway. But I remember you know, getting into the car. I remember driving. I remember thinking, I'm going to see my dead father. Like, how do you even process that, right? How does that even begin to look and feel? And although it was like a quick drive, it kind of felt like it took forever. It was just like, it was the most eerie, weird, twisted experience ever, honestly. So I get there, they let me in. Mind you, this is during COVID. This is July, 2020. So things are super locked down. Thankfully, they were kind of letting me see him when they knew he was like, going downhill when his health was really declining and they they knew death was near. But anyway, I had to do the mask and all the things and they let me in. Um, I remember walking in the room and I'll kind of keep a little bit of this to myself, honestly, but um, just, you know, draped with a white sheet. Um, I was absolutely terrified, terrified to touch him. Um, it's it's so weird. It's having actually, it's so interesting having one parent, like being there witnessing it from breathing to not versus like going into it. Like they're stiff, they're dead. Like they're gone is, is such a trip. I don't know if anybody else here has been through that, but it's wild. Um, but I did, I, I couldn't like not see his face one more time. And that is so ingrained in my brain. I will not go into detail about like what I saw or anything, but it just, you know, it's, it's, it's eerie seeing a dead person, no matter who it is. Um, but especially your father, when, you know, especially these people that might die from an illness or something and they don't look like themselves and then they're dead on top of it. And then they really don't look like themselves. And it's just like, it's a really brutal experience. Um, and that's when I, I actually remember being very scared, like, this is going to say, Hey, listen, we're, we're really honest on this podcast. Right. Okay. So I literally was just like, thought he was going to like come back to life. Like not because I was in denial that he was dead, but it was like, like zombie type stuff. I don't know why I'm being honest here, but seriously, it like, it freaked me out actually. Um, but I did kind of like uncover his face a little bit and I just like held his hand. It was still like just a touch warm. And I was like, Oh, thank God but I could feel it getting colder. And that really was very unsettling to me. And I just, I sat there as long as I could. I couldn't even tell you how long it was. Um, but there came a point where I was like, God, I have to be done with this. Like, I just, you know, you just can't see your loved one in that state anymore. Like I did what I could and I allow myself the grace to be okay with that. So I came out, of course I was, I was bawling at this point, you know, tears had come, reality had set in. Um, and I left and they, you know, eventually returned some of his belongings, but it actually royally pissed me off. They somehow lost some of his things. So I'm pretty sure like a car that my aunt had, his sister, my aunt had written him. Um, they even lost, like, I can't even remember what it was now, but like, I think maybe his shoes or like an item of his clothing. I mean, it was like barbaric. I I really frankly was not happy with this particular facility and all of that. Um, you know, the aftermath of all of that was just like pretty awful, but, um, you know, anyway, that morning was as peaceful, I guess you could say as it could be. So I eventually leave and I, honestly can't even tell you if I remember like sitting in my car or if I just went straight home, whatever. I think I just like tried to compose myself, went home, clearly could not go back to bed. Like I was up. So I just, I laid there. I cried. I laid there more. I mean, it was just hell on earth. And then eventually the sun began to rise and 
I have to be honest, it was like the most beautiful California day ever. It was sunny. It was warm. It was like this beautiful, serene, calm, everything is okay kind of sunrise. And I just remember, and I've I've talked about this. I, I might have even said this in another episode. I've certainly said it in blogs and things, but I just remember sitting there just catatonic, really. I just cried out at that point for for then, for that point at least, sitting on our living room couch, just like looking out our patio window and just staring and being like, how is this my life? Like, oh my God, both of my parents are dead. Like they are gone. They are never coming back. I can never see them again. I can never talk to them again. What? It just, it like the math was not mathing. Like it did not compute. And it was the emptiest, just horrible feeling I've ever felt in my life. I don't, I, it's so hard to even put words to. And it's so funny, like being in the grief space and being a coach and all of these things, but it's like, there are some events in your life that you really are just, that you are kind of at a loss for words. And that was one of them for me. So Eventually I started calling family. I called his first, of course, just being his siblings and let everyone know. And they kind of knew he was going downhill, but you know, you're never quite prepared for when it actually happens and hearing the news and all of the things. And, you know, everyone was just very graceful about it. And, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky in that capacity. And I just called a bunch of random people as much as, as many as I could, um, I think I told some friends. I don't know. I again, it's kind of gray area now a little bit, but and I I don't even know what I did the rest of that day. I don't think I did much of anything, honestly. So that was his death experience. And in the weeks following, you know, it was in such a funny state in life that I was in because my husband's been on the podcast and I've talked about this a little bit in various places here on losses become gains, but I had gone through a breakup with my then boyfriend, now husband. (laughs) If you haven't listened to that episode, please go listen to it. It's so good. (laughs) But you know, we were in kind of a complicated position and just as far as getting back together and we were kind of talking again, if you will. But you know, what's actually so ironic about July 13th is it's the day that my dad died, but it's also my father-in-law's birthday. (laughs) And that is a weird dynamic. Let me tell you, (laughs) not because of my father-in-law or anything. It's just like, it's just kind of crazy the way life works. Right. And it's hard associating that day with a birthday when it's such a devastating day for me and all the things. So today's, today's, today's a weird one. (laughs) In some ways, but I try not to focus on it too much. I, of course, remember my dad. I, you know, pay an homage to him however I can, but, um, you know, that that date has other significance to it too. So it's kind of interesting. And in the weeks and months after that, I mean, honestly, I just, you know, my, my husband and I got, we did get back together. So we were kind of rebuilding that relationship. I was, getting used to the fact, like literally I wanted to move to LA. Like I was totally like trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Like (laughs) in the time that we broke up to like just after my dad died and I was like, I don't even know if I want to stay here anymore. And like, you know, never make big life decisions when you are grieving or going through (laughs) any highly emotionally charged thing in life. Like, please. (laughs) But you know, the decision was made to stay where I was. John and I were going to give it another shot, all the things. So, you know, I I got used to life without him, I guess. I, I wish I had more insight there. I think I truly was just trying to function the best I could. I still had to work. I still had my geriatric dog to take care of at the time. And so what are you going to do? You know, it's like it's that's the excruciating part about grief is life does not stop right? It doesn't stop for you. Um, it doesn't stop for your grief. It doesn't stop because you've lost people. It's just, it's, it's brutal sometimes. So that's, that's really what it was. It was just rebuilding. And 
But as I reflect now, you know, and I kind of ask myself, like, what were the most difficult parts about that? Like, that's one thing I really wanted to reflect on and share with you guys here is, you know, what about his death was so hard and like what all of that looked like and felt like. And I kind of have this in my head in sort of like two different ways. So there was like the emotional aspect of it, like, of course, just like losing my dad. And I'll get more into that in a second, but then almost like kind of logistically too. So I'll talk about that in a second. I mean, emotionally, oh my God, like where to, where do I start? (laughs) Right. It was just the, the support that my dad gave. And I'm sure there's so many dads and father figures out there that it's just, there's something about dads, you know, that there's, there's just a comfort there for hopefully many of us with good relationships with our father figures. And that is like, by and large, just overarching, like I just miss his support, his love, his massive tight hugs <laughs> that he would give me. And it was like a special hug that I knew he had like just for me, not being able to talk to him. Like we would just have these beautiful conversations and about a variety of things in life, whether it was more serious topic or a you know sillier kind of whatever casual random topic, just that not being able to like call or text or more importantly, visit him and just hang out, watch our favorite movies, go to a coffee shop. I I used to love when we would do that. We would go over to like a town over or something like that. And he and I would just go to a coffee shop and just hang out. He would work or read or sketch. He was a beautiful sketch artist and painter. And so he would let me like maybe bring his art and I would read or work or whatever. And like, we didn't, even really need to talk like we did, of course, but like just being in each other's presence was so beautiful. And I miss that. I miss that so much. (laughs) Um, Talking about my future, his future, our future, like father-daughter trips that we wanted to go on and, and that we did go on. And he was always so good about prioritizing that with me. And I was so lucky because I, there are some friends of mine where I don't know if their dad ever took like just them on a trip like that. And like, I got to do that multiple times with him. Like, I know how lucky I am. And to have had that kind of relationship with my dad where that was a thing, like how cool. It is unbearably hard knowing he is not a part of my future in that way now, in all of these ways. And these are all really difficult things that I miss about him certainly today, but really just every day. So, you know, today when I'm thinking about what I miss the most about him right now, it's everything I just said. It's the big things and it's the small things. Quick interruption, then we'll get back to the content, but I promise this will be so worth it. I recently discovered help texts, and let me tell you, I so wish this is something I had found when I was first going through the absolute worst parts of my grief. What they provide resonated with me immediately, and I love how personalized you can make it to your specific loss. It's also perfect for friends and family who maybe want to provide some support, but don't always know how. Help Text provides easily accessible grief support via text to not only those who have suffered a loss, but also their support network. So it allows you to add up to two people to your account so they can receive helpful messages too. And they even have options for corporations if you're maybe part of a larger business that is looking to better support your employees. Sign up takes less than five minutes and you'll receive your first message right away. And because you would be signing up through me, you'll receive my personal discount as well. So you will get 12 months of help text for a very special price. When life gets hard, getting support from help texts honestly could not be easier. And I am so excited for you to try it out. I've been using it for a while now. And seriously, I am absolutely loving it. Check out the details in the show notes and be sure to use code LBG when you sign up. And I know I just mentioned the kind of logistics of it too. So I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up, but again, just to validate if anyone's going through this right now, like the emotional stuff is excruciating, but like, let's have a moment for like everything that can come along with the death of somebody. So like, especially having two dead parents, God, it was hell in terms of like legal things, 
tax implications, probate, having to like take on their condo. I had never owned a house before. I like, I still don't know what the hell I'm doing with many of these things. Right. So, and these are things that are literally what I would have gone to and asked my parents about. Like, it's so frustrating. I'm sure a lot of you can empathize with this, that not being able to ask the people the question that you would like normally go to for, hopefully all of that just made sense. I think you got the gist of what I'm saying. (laughs) It's like the people that you would normally reach out to for things are the ones you can't talk to. That's what I'm trying to say here. So just, (laughs) it's just the worst. Some of the things that I loved about my dad, I really wanted to share this today, just a few things that I really loved about him and I learned from him in terms of life lessons that can kind of relate in in a lot of ways, I think, and probably maybe even some things that you're experiencing or or are or will going through, will go through, are, you know, he first and foremost, whenever I think of my dad, he was the most compassionate soul I have ever met. Like other than my mom, I have never met anyone quite like him and I have never had anyone love me like he did. Like, sure, my husband loves me. Friends might love me, whatever, (laughs) in their own ways. But the way that my dad loved, I've never seen or experienced anything like that in my life. Um, So fortunate. He listened so intently. He was the best listener. He never imposed anything on you. He only gave his two cents, like if you asked for it or if you like felt like, okay, here's what I have to say about this, but like in such a beautiful, composed way. And, you know, for me, I mean, really there are a lot of things, but those are things that I really want and I really hope to take with me through my life to be kind, to be considerate, to listen well and listen listen actively. And I I really think that's also why coaching resonates with me so much and and being this, you know, support for fellow grievers is just to to hear and so people can be heard. And he was just such a beautiful example of that. To be polite, to be smart, to think outside of the box. I think I've said this before, but he was a wonderful criminal defense attorney and insanely intelligent. Like I don't know what his IQ was, but I know it was like far above normal. And the way his mind worked was truly like so fun and interesting to watch. And like law was his calling. Like he knew that we all knew that it was so obvious with how much he loved it and how good he was at it. And that really inspired me. So really quick, just speaking of work, one thing he always said to me that I will never forget. And this is like a bit of a paraphrase, but He would say like, when it comes to your career or your work, I hope you find something that you love to do so much that you feel like you are never, quote, working another day in your life. And what's weirdly twisted about this is I genuinely believe, I know, I know for a fact that the grief space is where I am meant to be, helping a griever like you, someone that is going through a hardship and feeling stuck or devastated after a loss or are unsure of what to do next, whatever that situation looks like, because it can come in so many shapes and sizes, (laughs) grief and loss and adversity, because grief is so much more than our grief or just the loss. It's everything that comes after it, right? It's how to do life differently than what we've been accustomed to what we've been used to. And quite honestly, I'm just going to put this out there. Had I not experienced this through the loss of my dad, of my parents, both of them, I wouldn't know this. I couldn't speak to this really at all, or certainly not as accurately or as impactfully if I hadn't been through what I have. You know, you can hear this all the time. Like, People who haven't been through grief or haven't been through some serious trauma or lost someone like a parent, like a child, like whoever it is that might be close to you, like you cannot really understand unless you've been through it. So as crappy as a hand of cards, I feel I've been dealt some days. I think about those things and I'm like, oh, did I find my, my soul's purpose? in life from all of this? 
Yeah, I think I did. And more of that coming up in just a moment. But what I've learned from his death amongst some of the things I just said is a few things. One, it is certainly finding something I love to do in life and finding my purpose, which I know wholeheartedly that I have. And I know I was meant to be a teacher, a guide, an empath, a visionary in the grief space, if you will. And by the way, a visionary is one of my dharma archetypes, which is why I say that. That's why I word it that way. But it's also to learn what you can take away from experiences, from hardships like this. And please, again, I'll say this till the cows come home, like, and please know that this comes with time. This isn't something I learned within days or weeks or even months after my dad died. Like this was probably at least a year and a half after he died and because then my sweet dog had died after that. It was like a lot of death for me to really be able to like take a step back and take a breath and realize what this really meant for me now. But being three years out now today, there's more about life that I understand. There's more about loss that I understand that it's deeper than us and it's deeper than this physical, often very material world that we live in and how we continue our relationship with our loved ones when they die. What's difficult around this three-year mark, I really wanted to make sure I just touched on this a little bit today because, you know, I know it's so hard, especially if you're in some acute grief or whatever it is, you're kind of like, oh my God, does this ever get easier? No, it doesn't get easier. And, you know, we tell ourselves this and remember this, if you're having any kind of negative, like self-talk and like, I'll never get over this, this will never get easier. Listen, it is. Easier is like not even the right word. It's just how you reframe the way that you think about your grief and your losses and incorporate it into your life to where it is not overcoming you, where it's not overwhelming you. So I think what is and always will be hard is that as much as we say our relationship with our loved one has changed and will continue to change, that's absolutely true. Like we can find signs and symbols and tap into these beautiful moments where like we know they're with us or like we can feel them or whatever it is, however they show up for us. And that's amazing. And I very much encourage that. Like I will continue to, you know, sing that from the rooftops, <laughs> but let, let's be very blunt. Like it cannot make up for the fact that they're not here. That's brutal. Like that we, we too miss them so deeply and their physical absence can be gut wrenching and heartbreaking and can feel nearly impossible to get used to. Like if that's where you are right now, I know I I get it. I've been there. I'm still not totally used to it. It's one of the most unfair things about life that we have to endure as humans here. It really is. One of the other things that I've noticed around the three-year mark is I'm also realizing it's actually very common. I feel a lot of people, there's like this three-year itch. I don't know what it is, Um, but we feel, we can feel further away from them. So perhaps feeling a bit disconnected from them and almost in this really weird place between feeling like their, their death or whatever it was like just happened like yesterday. Like we can remember it just like yesterday. just like everything I recalled earlier. Right. But also it feels like so long ago in a way, like you remember everything so vividly, but you almost like worry that and a lot of grievers feel this way where we like worry that we're going to for like forget things about them their voice their mannerisms things they would or wouldn't say to us or guidance or advice or whatever it is and that's stressful like that is unsettling and i worry about this all the time to be perfectly honest like especially being an only child there's almost this pressure this self-imposed pressure <laughs> That, you know, if I 
don't remember things or if I can't remember certain things, if I die, it dies with me. So I sometimes question myself or I second guess myself. I worry about those things sometimes, like not nearly to the point where I'm like losing sleep over it and it's like really affecting me. But I just want to, again, validate that if you're all worried about that, if you're at that place or even whether you're three years out or a little before that or, you know, 10 years out, we're, we're all susceptible to to feeling that way and being a little scared about that. So I just wanted to put that out there today. And you know, I think one of the last things that just came to me was like, it's also that feeling of like, God, I wish I could just ask him that question or them that question, whoever this is for you. Like, I wish I could ask that question or fact check this or (laughs) whatever it is. And to constantly have that realization over and over that we can't, it gets old. (laughs) It gets really old. I I don't have a more eloquent way to say that (laughs) right now, but it's just, um, it's something that we wish we had and we could have back or that we could call or text or, you know, all the things I was saying earlier, we wish we could just see them, give them a hug, anything like by and large, that is the one thing, my God, if I couldn't talk to my dad right now, what I wouldn't give for a hug. So to begin closing out this episode a little bit, I just want to encourage you today. If you're at a point where you feel like you will just not get used to this new reality of yours without whatever loved one you've lost. And again, this could be a divorce. Like there, there, I want to just, again, empower you to know that like there could be other secondary losses or things that have stemmed from a primary loss that we can deal with. Um, so anyway, I just want everyone to feel seen here, but I know it can feel like we're just not going to get used to it, but I want to challenge you today not to think about it that way. So hang with me on this one. Don't force yourself to get used to it and don't force yourself to feel like you need to feel right about their death to come to terms with it. That, in my opinion, is not realistic. And I think many out there would agree. What it is now is figuring out what your quote unquote new normal looks like and embracing that along with your grief. And there are tools out there for you. I promise my blog is one of them. My Grief Becomes Gains online course is one of them. If you want to work with me one-on-one, that's something. But you know, this can also mean finding new things you love to do. That can mean new hobbies, self-improvement, learning a new language or skills, meditation. My gosh, it's legendary. And it's it's a way that you can feel closer to your loved ones if you do it in such a way. So just want to plant that seed. Tapping into a career maybe that you've never thought to do. I mean, I could go on and on here. But one really special thing that I definitely did want to share with you in this episode is that as of this recording, I, in addition to grief coaching, am currently training to become a Dharma coach, a soul purpose coach as well. If you aren't familiar with Sahara Rose, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned her on this podcast before, but if you aren't familiar with her and her highest self podcast, definitely go check her out on Instagram or her website or the podcast. She's amazing. But she, Dr. Nita Bhushan, I want to make sure I get these names right, and Ajit Nawaka created the Dharma Coaching Institute. So if you've never heard of this, DCI, as we kind of call it for short, combines Eastern and Western traditions of many things. So Ayurveda, chakras and the doshas, spiritual life coaching, human design, embodiment, the feminine and masculine, integration, meditation and visualization. Hello, perfect for getting in touch with our loved ones. Human psychology and cross-cultural understanding, higher brain thinking, which is so important as we're grieving and we are thinking very low brain, very like, oh, woe is me. Oh my gosh, I'll never get over this. I'll never get used to this. Those things I was alluding to earlier. They talk about emotional management and so much more. So the reason I'm telling you this is because when you listen to this podcast, or if you ever work with me in a one-on-one setting or a group coaching setting through my course, whatever this looks like, it's this training that I'm also bringing into the grief work and coaching too. Because like I said, 
loss is more than just the grief that we feel. It is, of course, completely about the person or people that we've lost. Like that's what we're missing, right? But the grief itself, while profound and important, trust me, I know so many of us struggle with that, but it goes deeper than that. And that's what I want you to really walk away with and understand. It's seeing that proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. It's feeling like we're living and not just existing, right? It's figuring out where to go next or what to do with ourselves when we are just like, we don't even know which way is up or where the door is. (laughs) And this is very much how I felt when my dad died. Um, I felt this with my mom, of course, but like my dad was still here. I still had a little bit of an anchor, but once dad died, like I was out in the ocean by myself, thinnest possible life raft, very, very uncomfortable. And I questioned my decisions and choices and what I wanted out of my life and all the things. So by integrating this Dharma aspect into the grief space, what we are meant to be doing here in this lifetime, and not only addressing our grief, but incorporating this Dharma, this soul's purpose work into our existence and knowing our world doesn't have to come to an end when our loved ones die, that is a really spectacular feeling. Trust me. I know because I've been there, I am there, and this mindset has quite literally transformed my life. It has completely turned my grief around for me. In fact, it was kind of inadvertently, quite frankly, because I didn't discover DCI until earlier this year, but really when I was going through my very early stages of grief, I sort of inadvertently tackled both my my losses getting used to life without my parents and this like life work you know like what i really wanted to get out of it now that they were gone and that has allowed me to get to the point that i am at so i want you to know that it is possible today it is possible for you and to use the wise words of greg jordan <laughs> to discover things that make you feel happy and whole, because I promise you they are out there. Whether it's with your career or whatever it is, your soul is a beautiful being that deserves to enjoy its time here. Loss is earth shattering. Like let's just call a spade a spade, right? (laughs) Like loss is devastating. And it's something that we may never feel particularly certainly comfortable with. We might never feel whole again. Like the absence of someone we love can absolutely leave a hole in our heart and our soul. I completely, completely get that. But there is purpose in the pain and gains to be found from your losses. Always remember that. All right, you guys, thank you for hanging out with me as I reflected back on three years without my dad. I honestly still can't believe I'm saying that out loud, to be perfectly honest, (laughs) but I am sending you endless amounts of love today and to you and to whoever you've lost, whatever adversity you are journeying through. And please remember you are not alone. Okay. Have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you in the next episode. I am sending you a huge thank you for tuning into today's episode, my friend. I'm so grateful you're here and for the steps that you're taking to heal your heart, open your mind, fulfill your soul, to learn, grow, and evolve, and move through this crazy thing called life in big, beautiful, impactful ways. Visit lossesbecomegains.com for my blog and for more coping tools. Explore my Grief Becomes Gains online course if you need some extra grief support and coaching. And be sure you're following along on Instagram and Facebook at Losses Become Gains Podcast. I love seeing new faces, meeting new people, hearing your story, and supporting you however I can. And remember to always keep asking yourself, how will I turn my losses into gains today? I'll catch you in the next episode.